Okay, this is uh, introducing Kotlin in your organization, the easy way. Uh, this is a talk I've made um, based on a story that I've lived uh, two years ago. Uh, first of all, this is the Kotlin room. So we're going to talk about Kotlin a little bit, but uh, do keep in mind that I made this talk, you know, because I saw a lot of people and developers around me frustrated because they couldn't get a technology a library adopted uh, around them at work. And yeah, I, I've compiled a few tips that I've used uh, with a friend to actually get Kotlin in the company uh, two years ago. So I hope it can be useful for you too. My name is Julien Langrand Lambert. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Adyen during the day. Uh, I've also just been named Kotlin Google Developer Expert, which doesn't mean much, but I'm super happy that other people recognize me for my Kotlin work. That's nice. You can find me online on at J Langrand. And um, yeah, a few things I before COVID, uh, I used to really love meetups and organize a lot of them. I do a lot of Kotlin um, in a few places and also I'm gardening a lot. So if you're interested in gardening tips, you can go um, on Twitter, for example. Um, this talk is about two things. We're going to look at Kotlin today and you know why it could be useful for you and your colleagues, uh, but also how to convince them and how to convince people around you that you know, you've made the right choice and this is a good idea. The reason for me to make this talk is um, yeah, something that I lived together with my team um, two years ago. Well, uh, until six months ago, I was a team lead at ING and we were working with, you know, existing applications that were quite old, not old, but, you know, they were existing for a couple of years. So no greenfield. We couldn't start from scratch and we kind of were still stuck on Java 8. I think it changed since then, but some local tooling were forcing us to use Java 8 still. And um, Kotlin for us wasn't at the beginning, I wasn't like, oh, because, you know, it's the language is so great, but it was for us a way to keep learning, to experiment, to grow as a team. And you can find all of that in a, in a blog post that we wrote at the end of our journey. It took almost a year for us to get Kotlin at ING, but we'll see a little more, a little more why in a second. Um, and Actually, one of the main reasons Kotlin itself is not complicated, it runs on a JVM, so it's actually not difficult to put in production. But then you have to do, to do convincing at many levels, right? I just mentioned I was working in a bank, um, but it might also be just as important in other types of companies. We had to, you know, um, we were the first ones to try that out in the non-Android world. So we kind of had to convince security, had to talk on compliance, had to convince management above us that it wasn't a risk, convince colleagues as well. And first of all, convince the rest of our team. We were, two of us were like really convinced that Kotlin was the next thing for us, but then we kind of had to convince the other ones around us first as well. Um, so first we're going to take a step back and look at Kotlin today. Uh, just for information, I compiled a few numbers because I find that interesting. It uh, puts things in perspective. Kotlin is just about 10 years old um, compared to, you know, Java 26 years old. Um, but interesting, Go, for example, is 12 years old and Rust 11. So I was expecting Rust to be a younger language than Kotlin was, but it isn't the case, actually. Uh, some other numbers uh, that I've compiled from uh, was just the 10 years of Kotlin this year. So Kotlin made a, like JetBrains made a super nice website. You can go on, uh, on, on the website and have a look. Um, they mentioned that there was uh, last year over almost 5 million users uh, of Kotlin and 1.23 million that used it at least once in the last year. Uh, it's also the fourth most, lo most loved programming language following a Stack Overflow survey from 2020. And following a survey from SNCC from last year, it's also the second most popular language on the JVM. So it kind of went over Clojure, over Scala or Groovy, uh, just behind Java. Last one worth mentioning, because I think it tells a lot about the future of the language. It's thought in 45 of the top 200 universities in, around the world, it kind of says that there is a future for Kotlin. Um, and as I'm mentioning, Kotlin is here to stay. If you look at it, there are strong signals in the industry uh, that show that, you know, Kotlin is here to stay. Uh, I think the very first big bang was 2029 when Google chose Kotlin uh, first for Android. Two years ago, we had two years ago already, actually, we had the creation of the Kotlin Foundation. And last year, a couple more examples of things that happened that really make, uh, you know, Kotlin the first, um, what do you call that? first level language today, uh, first first citizen. AWS announcing idiomatic Kotlin SDK is really a big thing for me. 
because you know a lot of people use AWS. But also uh, Kotlin multi-platform coming out of beta last year brings a lot of more potential use cases for Kotlin users. Uh, let's look really quickly at a few examples of why Kotlin was interesting for us. Um, as I said, we didn't look deeply into performance or into certain libraries. We just looked at the language and thought that there was a few things that made a lot of sense, uh, being very pragmatic. So first of all, what uh, Venka Subramanian would call ceremony. Of course, it's very well known, but if you look at, you know, data class, um, like a simple class um, for an object in um, in Java, you would have, you know, to give in the, the parameter names, the getters, the setters, the constructors, etc. Everything can be done in one line in Kotlin, including default uh, default values, which is very nice. You know, 2022, so you kind of expect the, the language to do the work for you. You don't want to have to do much ceremony, right? Um, another famous example for Kotlin concurrency, right? Coroutine is quite famous if you look at a difference something running on uh, on Java and something running on Kotlin, there isn't much difference, right? It's not like there's 20 more lines of code or something. But on the right, you know, it's it's easier to use. The DSL is a bit more um, pleasant, I would say. Functional programming also, you know, functional programming is the first, uh, first citizen of Kotlin. So again, not a huge difference, but Kotlin makes it a bit easier to work with a uh, with functional programming, you don't have to collect at the end, it's kind of automated. You don't have to use the streams. Um, there's some helpers. You can use the, you know, the, the eat um, to select your current um, um, current object. So that all of those things help you a lot, right? And the last one, which is our favorite, uh, sealed classes. You know, being able to contain and contain your world in a certain area, and then be, have the language help you. So when you do a when on those field classes, for example, then you know that all of your um, use cases have been taken into account. You won't get into weird uh, trouble because you've forgotten one thing. Um, something we picked up from Elm, really, really appreciate it every day when we write Kotlin. So let's do it. Um, you have a Java application, it's five years old. Um, how does it look if you want to convert it to Kotlin? Well, the way we do it, um, we did it, it's like this, right? Take the simplest class we can think of, right click and convert Java file to Kotlin file IntelliJ. Bang, that happens. And once this is done, um, IntelliJ will realize that you have some Kotlin in your application. So it's gonna tell you, hey, do you want to configure Kotlin with Java? It's like, we're gonna add some uh, some stuff in your Maven file so that you add uh, have Kotlin support in there. Okay, let's all do it, no problems. Um, this is 1.6 now, this is quite an old screenshot, but yeah, Kotlin, um, IntelliJ will realize, okay, there's Kotlin now. So how about we install Kotlin on your IntelliJ? Yeah, thank you on your platform. Very nice. And that's it. Once we're there, uh, we just have to try in production. Like we just have to, to release it, right? Um, which is what we've done. So literally speaking, if we look at it, it took us, yeah, just about 30 minutes on a Friday evening, uh, just before a beer, not after, uh, to deploy some Kotlin on production. And that was nice. But then you kind of have to, okay, go back one step and say, okay, we've done it. We know it's possible. Uh, we know we want to move forward with it. How do you go from there? So that's where the real work begins. Uh, if you look at it, that's where the convincing starts. Um, and I'm going to go through uh, a few different use cases, few different methods. Of course, you don't have to use them all. Uh, but what, what I'm really trying to do here is to show you kind of a toolbox of, okay, I'm a developer. For me, it's just completely obvious that I should be using that at work. You know, take it, this is Kotlin, but you can take Kubernetes, uh, you can take an API gateway, you name it. And let's look at, you know, different ways we can actually get other people to think the same as you. How do you use the right way to convince others? Uh, first of all, <laughs> first and foremost, invest in your own knowledge, right? If you want to convince others, you kind of have to show that you know what you're talking about and you have to not know everything, but you have to have to exude confidence to a certain extent. Uh, one thing for us that was really nice is there is this Coursera course, Kotlin for Java developers. If you're a Java developer, it's really easy to, you know, uh, take this, this course, I think it's four weeks, and then you step into Kotlin um, that gives you enough confidence to move around. And that gives you um, enough tools to actually be the, you know, the expert uh, in the company. And expert is relative, right? If everybody knows less than you, then you're kind of the expert by default. 
Um, but the next step is also to take this one step further and help solve other people's questions. All right. If people come up with questions, saying I don't know is fine, uh, of course, because you know we're all learning there, and you have to be aware of that, and and, and uh, you have to be saying that you're learning. But you also have to take a step and then you know, say try to answer other people's questions. So that's number one. But number two is okay. Now we've 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 shown that we're kind of there to help other people, but we want to get people on board, um, and they don't really want to take the risk uh, yet of testing the application. For us, one really nice way to do it was with, uh, using Advent of Code. So we've organized Advent of Code inside the company, and we said, you know what, every day uh, we'll help you do it in Kotlin. And I really onboarded a lot of uh, our colleagues just for the fun of learning. Right? It wasn't related to uh, the company at all. So that's a good way to move forward, but there are other ways, right? Um, after that, we've done cohorts, which are like, okay, in March until April, every week, I'm going to take a group of 30 people and we're going to learn Kotlin together. And that's something that we do as, as well at IDN. And that's very nice because it allows people to learn together and in a safe environment and people create connections as well, which is very nice. And last but not least, uh, in terms of Kotlin, I've shown, you know, at ING, we had a lot of existing applications, a little less greenfield. So coming to another team and saying, okay, for the coming three hours, I'm going to go with you. And at the end, in three hours, you will have some Kotlin on production and I will, I will guide you up to there. And then it's up to you, really helped us. Convincing colleagues is usually easy. Uh, <laughs> For a simple reason, most of them are just as interested as you are in tech. Uh, they probably have seen Kotlin already. They just maybe hadn't take the step, taken the step yet uh, to learn it. Management is another uh, uh, another thing, right? Because they have other priorities. Um, and usually the first one is, you know, it's a risk for me, right? You come and you say you want to try Kotlin. Okay, uh, but you're going to take longer to do stuff. Uh, it's a risk. If you leave the team, then how do, do I do? Like there's a whole lot of questions coming in people's minds. So one of the ways we've started is to say, okay, it's a small experiment. Uh, like remove the danger, like the alarm bells from, from people's minds. And the first one is, okay, we make it contain. It's just our application. We make it risk-free. Like we make it so that we can actually go back. Uh, we don't rewrite from from uh, from from scratch. We just move forward with it. We make it reversible. Again, it is just what we do from now on. It is for that feature in point in time, and then we go together and we look at how it went at the end of that feature, so we can go back. And we make it cheap by saying, okay, you know what? We are learning on our like partly on our own time. We promise we make our best uh, to make sure that we will not take more time to write what we're doing. That really helped a lot, uh, our direct management to say, okay, we are making a small experiment. You know, we really should be learning and you can gain a lot and there is almost nothing to lose. One thing that's important is if you do those small experiments, that's great. Uh, that's a very good news, but then don't forget to go back and report, right? Because that's, that's the most important part. If you, you know, you get a green, green light, that's nice uh, for a limited time. Now, if you want to get the next step, you kind of have to report, come back, communicate about progress. And at this point, if it's a success, don't communicate only to your manager, but verbalize it. Say, okay, now we're going to do that. We're going to involve this other team. We're going to do this other application. And ideally do it in public, even if it's internal, even if it's inside the company, show that you're doing it because other people will get interested and they will learn from you. And if you pave the way, it's much easier for people to come behind you. And the more people are joining you, of course, the easier it is to uh, to prove success and to move forward. Um, so report is something that's usually uh, forgotten a lot. And then sometimes people are surprised because something comes back and say, okay, we're stopping with this. And they're like, yeah, but we're doing so great. Why is that? Well, maybe you just didn't communicate enough about what you have been doing. Use numbers. You know, um, as I said, managers... If they're a bit far away from your application in your code, they care a lot more about other things. So you kind of have to adapt what you're saying, even if it's obvious for you, you have to adapt and think, okay, what is important for them? <laughs> that sounds obvious, but I've seen so many people not do it. Like, why is Kubernetes, why is Kotlin important for your management? Why is it important for your company? Um, and then the numbers, you can pick them up. Uh, there really is, you know, uh, a whole array of things you can pick from. 
even internal numbers. At some point, we've used the fact that, you know, we had, uh, we were undergoing a lot of migrations. There wasn't much innovation for our, uh, the teams to go through. So we were like, you know, Kotlin can be an innovation that is cheap and it doesn't cost any extra, extra work. And it can go as we are doing the migration. So it helps with, you know, uh, happiness at work. Um, yeah, and in this case, one of the things that helped a lot is showing that, you know, Kotlin was really loved as part of the JVM. We were really attached to the JVM, so having Kotlin uh, second most loved language really helps. All right, another one that might sound use, uh, useful, but sometimes, and very often actually, you have heroes inside of the company. And what I mean by heroes is people that really want you to succeed. Uh, that can be a manager, can be a colleague, can be anyone, sometimes even marketing or hiring recruitment, I don't know. Um, but there are heroes that really want you to succeed. And those ones, you have to kind of find them and be aware of them and bring them with you. Uh, who's a big, oh, that's a nice typo, who's a big fan of the language? Like, is there someone who really loves the language up there? Maybe your CTO has dived into it, you know, and if you mention it to him, he's going to get excited. And that's like the best ally you can have. But maybe a recruitment is really trying to find a new angle to bring new engineers. And then if you start mentioning that you're using Kotlin at work, it helps. Um, find your heroes because you can bring them with you and make this um, a success much easier than if you just want one of your team. And another thing that I really uh, used quite a lot back in my time for a lot of things actually is bring heroes from outside. One of the best things you can do is make sure that your managers, your colleagues, everybody is really embedded into the language. And if they don't go for the knowledge themselves, you can bring it to them. Uh, and we've done, we've done that by bringing, we had Trisha G, uh, G over uh, from JetBrains and we discussed a lot about JVM, about Kotlin when she came uh, over. And I made sure that the managers were in the room and you know, your choice becomes a reality. Yeah, by the way, I showed you, I told you about this thing, you know, well, there was two events about it last month and then there was this happening in Amsterdam. By making it visible, you just make your thing become a reality. And a very nice example that I really like from uh, Yoris, from a company called Ximedes. They're a consultancy company. Uh, they also have products, but they, they do a lot of consultancy for companies. And they kind of wrote a blog saying, Kotlin is the new default language for us. Um, and by writing that, it's kind of a, you know, you make your own reality <laughs> by writing that this is Kotlin, a default, you could just tell people, okay, we have made this, it is a commitment and it helps a lot uh, going against, um, yeah, people that don't agree. And last one is, um, I don't, yeah, almost the last one is find authority. If you can, it really helps. People do, do care about that. And Google Developer Expert for me is, is a nice way. I don't particularly... Uh, think that it makes me a better human or anything, but it really helps people say, okay, this person has spent time into the language uh, and I kind of trust him, her and them. There's also other ways, like if you do uh, want to involve Kubernetes, you can do certifications, uh, there are courses, sometimes there are titles, you know, there are ways to kind of easily within one second show that you have some kind of authority on the topic and that really helps carrying the, the discussions forward. Uh, last but not least, I want to uh, conclude with that. Don't forget to not be a zealot. Uh, <laughs> that's very important. Like, it's nice to love something. I, I'm totally in love with Kotlin and other things I'm, like we could discuss about Elm a lot. Don't forget that not everything has to go, um, you know, you're not always right. Maybe sometimes the, it's not the right moment to use something. It's not the right tool that can also be. Um, you know, there's always those famous uh, tab versus space or formatting discussions where people, you know, yell at each other regarding how th something should be formatted. At some point, you just have to let it go and accept, okay, maybe that's not the right use case because that's going to play against you next time you will present something. All right. Um, I'm almost there. I'm going to take one minute. I'm going to actually, and I think I might not even answer them, but some fun questions I've gotten why we were convincing people to use Kotlin. And I, I just want to report on them because they're really funny. Um, once, okay, if we allow Kotlin today, why not Haskell tomorrow? Like, are gonna people not going to go bonkers? Um, and that's a very valid question as a manager, right? I'm allowing you, I'm giving you freedom. And how much freedom are con people going to expect tomorrow? It shows that you kind of have to show boundaries. You kind of have to think into, okay, why is that person going to think? And one way for us to answer was to say, well, we are stuck on the JVM, like we chose for the JVM because of safety, because of many reasons. 
So we allow JVM languages. So you can have, okay, a certain level of freedom, but not too much. How can we hire people at no Kotlin? Wouldn't it be harder to find them on the market? And that's true. If you like Kotlin developer, that, that was true definitely in 2019 when we were doing uh, going through. One way we answered was actually, that's the other way around. You're going to keep your engineers because a lot of Java engineers want to search for the next thing. We're still on Java 8 for the moment. You know, allowing Kotlin is a way to keep your current engineers. So don't think about what's on the market just yet. First of all, you can just hire Java engineers, but also internally, you're actually making your Java engineers more involved, which is nice. Can Kotlin die tomorrow? Like, look at what happened to, I don't want to mention it, but there are other JVM languages that are less successful today. That is true. You have to look at it. Like, it is a possibility. Can, Kotlin can, can, you know, stop being used tomorrow because, because Flutter, for example, in, in the mobile space. Um, you have to look at it with reality again and not just say, no, it's not possible. There are signs of the market like AWS adopting it that show that, you know, it's probably going to stay for a long time. We're still showing, seeing adoption, but don't forget that it's a possibility. So consider it. And yeah, don't forget that some people at some places don't have to be technical. So we you know we've got a question like, so Kotlin is like replacing AngularJS. You kind of have to take that question seriously and take a step back and then try to really explain what it's about because if you're going on the wrong thing and you've, you might have, uh, you might think that you have got a, a good meeting, but if the person hasn't understood you in the first place, you know, might not go the way you want it. Yeah. And I'm going to close with that. Why don't users use Scala? You know, that's a good place. That's a good question. Like uh, we're talking about Zlots. We on Scala, you already have places and processes in place. What do you care about Kotlin? Well, you kind of have to explain it and I'll leave it to you to do it. Well, thank you. Uh, we can't take questions. I would have loved to see you live, but it's online. Unfortunately, I'll be in the Q&A room, I think. Um, I hope we meet someday and I uh, thank you very much. And I want to end with a, thank, a very big thank you for uh, to Hilke de Vries, uh, who was my buddy at ING and he helped me a lot. And like, we wouldn't have uh, been able to do it if it wasn't for the two of us. So that's it. You can find the sources on GitHub. Cheers.